So whether the market is doing gangbusters or looking more like a dumpster fire, a good, well-rounded stock portfolio is necessary for any investor. Robinhood is a platform that aims to democratize finance for everybody. Robinhood believes everyone should have access to financial markets, so what they did was they built their system from the ground up to make investing friendly, approachable, and understandable for newcomers and experts alike. What I love about Robinhood is that you don't need an account minimum to start. There are zero fees for trading, and you can even purchase cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. Join today by tapping the link in the show notes to get a free stock just like that. I mean, it's just free just for signing up. And this free stock can be anything from Sirius XM to Apple or any of the other thousands of other publicly traded companies just like that. You've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. So go get your free stock today by checking out that Robinhood link in the show notes today. So there I was, tending to my flock of chihuahuas while watering my crops of jalapenos under a hot, harsh Mexican sun, all on my lonesome with not another soul in sight, having just retired from the harsh and vicious world of politics and amateur journalism, when suddenly he came. He came like a crack of lightning in the night right in front of me in a cloud of smoke. El, el jefe, I said. Yes, Remzo, it is I, Chris Spangle, Supreme Leader of the Libertarians, he said, with an awesome mighty glow behind him, while riding on a giant tiger that shot lasers from its eyes. But I, I, I digress. I need you for an important task, Remzo. I need you to help me build the wall. I, I was befuddled by that request. I, uh, I, I, I didn't really think, you know, building walls was our thing. Then he replied, no, no, not that wall. I'm talking the wall. Then with a the snap of his fingers, I appeared behind my trusty podcasting microphone once again. And then his thunderous voice came about the room saying, welcome to the We Are Libertarians Empire, young inquisitor. Do our bidding well. And at that moment, back in the heart of the swamp of Washington, D.C., my mission, should I choose to accept, was once again to drag vampires into the light and giving a voice of hope and imagination to the downtrodden. I was once again on the run for freedom. On the run from ancient institutions of doom, group think of madness, tyrants of the mind and the soul. But I am not alone. I'm taking you with me, my courageous traveler. Let's go where few podcasts ever dare venture before. Prepare yourself. You're on the run with Remzo W. Martinez. Like Charlie Sheen's cocaine addiction and Robert Downey Jr.'s fantabulous acting career, I am back behind the microphone once again. Thank you all for tuning in to the premiere episode of On the Run. I am your host, grateful and joyous as always. Well, I'd, I'd be lying if I said always. Remso W. Martinez, I'm so happy for you to all, all all to be here. It's always great when you get to you know continue something you love. And podcasting has been something I've been doing since I think it was late 2015, early 2016 with my brother, the award-winning producer and director Ryan Martinez. Shout out to Ryan. We would not be here if you did not have nothing else to do back in college when you were my roommate and mom and dad said you have to hang out with me sometimes. All of that led to us here and what a crazy ride it's been. Friends, old and new alike, I am so excited to be here with you. Um, Several weeks ago, 
we were, my, my brother and I, we were doing a photo shoot for our upcoming season two of The Witching Hour on a public access station near you or on YouTube where you can see season one. And we were talking with, a, you know, one of the other crew members and he, he was kind of curious. He was like, Remso, I know you've been, you know, getting in and out of podcasting for a while. You've been busy with everything you've been doing at The Washington Times and the new book that came out and all the other madness going on in your life. But, you know, what's next? Because the podcast Cast was always something that, you know, was really your thing. And I, I told him, you know, I, I'd been thinking about it for a little while um, with the Remsen Republic having officially ended in May of 2018 and then with the rise of the Remsen Martinez, Martinez experience, the successor show to that. You can find all the archives online. The, the old show is still there. Fantastic interviews with everyone from Dallas Jenkins, uh, hit director of The Chosen, Matt Kibbe, Ron Paul, and so many other awesome folks. Um, you can go find all of that there. But, you know, he, he asked me, are, are you ever going to get back into it with the same amount of energy and dedication that you had before? And it, it was something that I wanted to do, but I felt like that chapter of my life was pretty much over. Um, we're done with taking photos and we get in the car and Ryan looks at me. He's like, you know, I know you and Chris Bangle know each other. You've been uh, you know, having some of your stuff shared on the website. You've been promoting some of the stuff on Twitter. Have you ever thought about asking Chris if maybe you can join the We Are Libertarians Network? And I looked at him and I said, Ryan, I, I Chris doesn't want me to bug the shit out of him. He's got enough stuff going on with enough crazy characters. He doesn't want me. I shit you not. Three days later, I, I get a call. Or was it a message? One or the other. One of the forms of communication. And it's Chris. And um, out of the blue, he's just like, hey, Remso, don't know if you're still interested in podcasting, but... If you were, maybe you could bring your old show over to the We Are Libertarians Network and we can help, you know, grow each other's platforms because we both have, um, you know, a dedication to liberty and entertainment and podcasting. Let me know what you think. And it was like one of the weirdest signs from above that I've ever received. So what do I do? I immediately get on the phone. I call up to Indiana and Chris and I agree that I'm going to come on with a brand new show. The one you're listening to right now on the fantastic We Are Libertarians Network. Now, this is somewhat of one of those crazy full circle moments for me. I remember the first show I ever really listened to the, the first ever actually just podcast in general was lines of Liberty. Mark Claire really did ignite the brush fires for the ideas of individual Liberty and economic freedom in me as a young college student. And then as I began to learn about more of the stuff going on, then I obviously got into we are libertarians and knowing this is around 2013. I mean, let, let's think of it. 2013, the Ron Paul movement is basically dead. Gary Johnson got 1%. Barack Obama is bombing the shit out of the world. Things aren't looking great for us, but suddenly, somehow, libertarianism has become a household word. To have this community online is beautiful. Libertarians really have social media to thank for learning of each other. I meet people all the time that said it was maybe a crazy meme or a podcast, or a show, or a blog, but somehow it was the giving grace of Al Gore's internet that showed us that we have a community together, and Chris Bangle has been doing that for years and years now, and to go from not knowing what a libertarian is, to doing all the crazy stuff I've done in between, to finally get to here, it is crazy. It's such a rush getting to come to you from this platform of great people. All the personalities and voices at the We Are Libertarians Network are doing what other libertarian groups don't often get to do, collaborate with each other, to just put out good, informative, entertaining content that pushes your views and your mind in different places. And I'm really excited to come here because I, I've basically... I'm done with politics, and what do I mean by that? I know for some of you that have known me for a few years, I'm so, what do you mean? Everything you do is politics. Well, 
it's just a part of my life was which is done being uh being a journalist being the social media coordinator for the washington times i get to do a lot of things i essentially feel like i'm the nick fury of libertarians and media because i've had the opportunity to give a platform and a voice to people that otherwise wouldn't get it from older institutions. I've been at the Washington Times for almost a year now, and when they interviewed me and they got to learn more about me, they were excited to bring someone in that had a foot in the conservative movement, a foot in the libertarian movement, because the ideas of you know, conservatism, libertarianism, it's changing, especially amongst young people that want more economic freedom, that want you to live your life as you see fit, as long as you don't hurt people and take their stuff. And having the crazy, (laughs) the crazy resume I had, having been from campaigns to nonprofits, to activist groups, to everything I did myself as a renegade guerrilla journalist, It was like all those years of hardship, all those years of being a mall cop by day and renegade reporter by night, all of that led me eventually to come here. So I I don't really know what else to say, but I'm excited to be here. And for this episode, we're going to do something a little bit different. Didn't just want to talk about myself going along monologue. We went ahead and did an AMA in the We Are Libertarians uh, group on Facebook. I think it's called the Walnuts Fans of the We Are Libertarians podcast. I probably got that wrong, but forgive me. It's my first day, folks. We can go ahead and keep moving. And hey, if you ever want to talk to me, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Parlor on Parlor. I'm just at Remso. Everywhere else, it's just Hey Remso. H e y r e m s o. Hey Remso. Find me, talk to me. Let's have a good time. But anyway, uh, let, I let people know that we were going to do an AMA for this episode. People texted me questions, messaged me questions, commented with questions. So I went ahead and grabbed, I think it's the list is about 20. And I'm just going to go through them. We're just going to have some good old-fashioned fun today. What do you say about that? So the first question is top three things you'd tell anyone who's starting a podcast slash writing a book. That is... Doesn't seem like a hard question, but it's a lot because how you would start a podcast and how you would, you know, start a book, they're kind of similar because they involve the same level of thought and organization that go into each other, but they're both very different things. Um, So I'm going to break it into a two part answer. So the top three things I tell anyone who's starting a podcast and writing a book um, for a podcast, one, understand what you want to do. It's a really hard thing for a lot of people that have never put themselves out there because putting yourself out there on the internet and saying to people, hey, I think you should look at me because I'm awesome isn't a very uh, easy thing. I used to get I used to get a lot of uh, hate mail, a lot of angry comments and messages towards the beginning. As I got bigger, I actually got less. I've got a few haters out there, but I used to get a lot of haters at the beginning. Um, one, just get, I think the first piece of advice is just put yourself out there and know you're doing something that 99% of people wish they could do, but they're not. You're going to get criticism. What I always tell myself is the people that out there that are going to hate you are going to hate you. The people that are out there who don't have opinion of you probably will not take an interest and still won't have an opinion of you. The people that will love you will love you. Everyone is predisposed to one thing or another. I really don't think that a lot of people, unlike what they usually say, which is, oh, I'll hear them out. I'll go check this source out. I'll go you know, try and get another opinion. No, more people, people are pretty set in their ways by the time they're driving cars, smoking dope, and getting laid. So I mean, just put yourself out there and have fun, but know what you want to do, whether it's going to be a how-to podcast, whether it's going to be a book um, that's a novel or a nonfiction thing. Just know that haters going to hate, ainers going to ain't, and people are going to love you if you try, irregardless as the final product. You'll get better as things go along. Don't expect yourself to be great, but just, you know, just, just know that up front. Second, um, do a little bit of preparation. A lot of people will just jump into something and let's put it this way. Your first podcast, your first manuscript, it's not going to be great. It's going to suck. It's going to suck donkey balls. But 
um, you know, if you just put maybe like a few hours, maybe a day, an afternoon at minimum into looking into what you need, that way you're less likely to encounter pitfalls. With the mic, with the podcast, actually, let's put it this way. I was much more prepared to start a podcast than I was a book. Now, the book and the podcast were about three years apart, so I had gotten into the rhythm of organization, finding things that I wouldn't other otherwise find elsewhere. But with the podcast, luckily, I had my brother Ryan who um, was my, you know, he's my actual brother. People think I'm just being very nice when I call my brother. No, like we, we, we shared a, you know, we shared a crib and we shared bunk beds in college. Uh, my junior, senior year at Liberty, my brother's freshman year, he's now at George Mason University, about to graduate this summer. Um, with Ryan, Ryan was more tech minded. I was more creativity minded. So luckily, we were able to combine our minds together. We knew what software to use, where to get music, where to design and uh, cover for the show, what we would kind of need to do, how many episodes should we publish, how long should they be. And, you know, with that, it was pretty easy. With a book, you know, I kind of just wrote the book and then I was kind of fumbling along. I'm like, oh, now I need editors. Oh, now I need a formatter. Oh, now I need a cover artist. Oh, now do I need a barcode? Okay, now am I going to publish or self-publish? Oh, wait, maybe I should have thought of that before I did all this stuff. Okay, rewind. Um, Do homework on what you're going to do. If you're going to learn how to do a podcast, don't just start recording and slap some shit on there and put it out and expect people to like crap. Because if you put no effort in, people will see that. If you let me repeat that, because I feel like people want to rationalize everything and say, "Well, what if I don't have time? What about this?" If it's if it matters to you, you're going to make time for it. But if you put out something with no effort, people are going to see you put no effort in. If you make mistakes, you make mistakes. My first podcast ever sucked. My first book had problems, but at least I put in the effort. So you know, step number two for book and podcast. Do your homework. Try try and learn what it is you're actually trying to do. And the third step, um, <laughs> I'm trying to say this in a nice way because I've used some very harsh metaphors before. You know, let me grab a drink before I say this out loud. That's right, folks. You're in the moment with me. Um, uh You can't just put your shit out there and expect people to want it. You have to promote. That sometimes means going out of your comfort zone and asking people to share it around, asking people to review it, asking people to take a look at it. Sometimes, and this will scare some people because this is the one thing that separates the pros from the amateurs, pros are willing to go in with their moolah. They're willing to go in with their money. Sometimes you have to pay for advertising. I'm not just talking about boosting ads on Facebook, which as a professional, I do not advise you do whatsoever. Facebook ads, terrible ROI. Sometimes you have to buy a commercial space on a podcast or a radio show. Sometimes you need to take out actual uh, you know, pages in a magazine or a comic book. I've done both. Sometimes you need to literally pay a kid to pass out flyers at his college campus. It sounds stupid, but I've done all of it. And what I will tell you is that if you're not promoting your show, no one else is because no one loves you that much to do your work for you. So if you have something that you've done and you want people to know about it, go to the people because rarely, except under very, very few circumstances, are people ever just going to come to you because you're naturally that charismatic and awesome. I am certainly not. I was certainly not. Therefore, I have to put work towards what I do. So those are the three things. Um, If you're going to do something, just know that the haters are out there, but you're going to find enough people, more than enough people, plenty of people that will love you. Do your homework as to whether or not you're going to do a podcast or a book. If you're going to do a podcast, learn how to podcast. If you're going to write a book, learn how to write a book. And lastly, promote your shit. Uh, great question. Great, great way to start this off. And um, you know, my my two books, definitely. If you buy both, I'm asking you to buy both. If you if you really want to learn about it, uh, my first book. There are mistakes in it. My first book was good though. I'm proud of my first book. Like everything, it was our first. So even with all its flaws, we're still going to love it. My second book, I think I I really nailed it. Is it 100 percent perfect? No. 
But everyone that's read it, they laugh, they cry, they reread it. My first book was Stay Away from the Libertarians, a nonfiction comedic look at the history of the modern libertarian movement. And my second book was a historical fiction dark comedy, How to Succeed in Politics and Other Forms of Devil Worship. They're both on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Um, Stay Away from the Libertarians and How to Succeed in Politics and Other Forms of Devil Worship. Moving on. What was it like at Liberty University? I went from... uh, a military school is a two-year military junior college, and um, from that environment where I got my uh, shit kicked in on a pretty regular basis, uh, I, I went to Marion Military Institute in Alabama where I got my early commission in the Army and my associate's degree in science, and then I went to Liberty. So I only had a full Liberty experience for two years. It was my junior and senior year, and at that point... I was already going into my major. My major was U.S. government politics and policy. It's different from political science, which is at what uh, which is what other schools really offer. The difference is we take more of a theory, philosophy, constitution, understanding approach of man's role in in a civil society, whereas political science at other schools doesn't touch on that as much. And the way I describe it is from having read the textbooks, having spoken to other political science majors, compared curriculums. So I'm not just saying this is someone that doesn't know, but um, I think a political science program at other schools, whether you're going for the BS route or the BA route, it's more about how to interact with the bureaucracy. So at Liberty, they teach you how the government should have been and should be. And at a pu- public university, even some private schools where it's just a basic political science program. It's more like how the government is and how it is going to be from a purely progressive uh, neoliberal view. So it was um, it was a fun experience. It, you know, a lot of people, when they think of Liberty University, they only hear the bad things about it. I, you know, I have my gripes and complaints, but overall it was a good experience and I wouldn't trade it for anything else because I made amazing friends for life. I met um, my girlfriend, Juliana, there my second month at Liberty, and we've been together since for five years now. And, um, you know, it was it, it was where I needed to go. I, I did a lot of things that I wouldn't have had a chance to do otherwise. I'm pretty sure that I would not have started the Rimser Republic podcast, which led to everything, if I had not gone to Liberty University. But, you know, people complain. It's like, oh, they make you make your bed and do room inspections. Well, I came from a military school, so it wasn't that big of a shock for me. Um, a lot of people like to attack Liberty because they force students to go to convocation three times a week. I never felt forced. I knew that was part of it, and I liked it because we got to hear from thought leaders, world leaders, leaders in religion, um, you know, the movers and shakers in entertainment, media, business. I mean, it was great. So I don't understand why people are like, oh, I, I was forced to go there. I'd get fine. It's like if you didn't want to do that, you didn't have to go to the school. Um, so, you know, you know what you're getting into. They don't hide it from you. Uh, my only problem was I had to take like 9, 12, 15, 15 credits of courses that will never transfer to any school. It was like biblical worldview and then the psychology class, which is a whole other thing itself. It, it was I don't know, I, it does not transfer to other schools, let's put it that way. But overall, I loved it. I mean, Lynchburg is a small town with big town ambitions. While I was there, I worked on three campaigns. I was the manager for two city council races, a ward race, and a at-large race, which covered the whole city, and a congressional race. And it was uh, it was it. I, they were experiences that I would have never got elsewhere, good and bad. While I was there, I volunteered at a local church, volunteered at a humane society, you know, cried some tears at the hard times, laughed and, you know, had fun in the good, had fun in the good times. And it's also in the middle of whiskey country. So as long as you were off campus and you didn't come back drunk, there are some great distilleries out there. Virginia Whiskey Distillery is my favorite. Silverback has a great honey, honey rye whiskey if you're more of a liqueur guy. I mean, just, just really great. Um, I think there's something called like Freaky Frog or Wild Toad. There's a, there's a microbrewery out there that has some great uh, ales and stuff. I mean, it's, it, it's a good experience. I think that if anyone wants to consider going to school there, go check it out. 
go check it out. I checked out plenty of schools. I checked out um, Georgetown at one point because I thought I was smart. And then I looked at my GPA and figured out that, you know, that dog don't bark. So I went to Liberty where ironically, you know, people say, oh, well, anyone can go to Liberty. But yeah, like it's very, e- it's a pretty easy school to get accepted to. I'll say that. I don't think anyone will deny that. But you look at the graduation rate, and it's actually a very difficult school to graduate from. Not many people, especially residential students, especially residential students, not many people graduate from there. So Liberty's got its pros and cons, but you know, I've got my alumni ring. I, I, I have the alumni sticker. I've got good friends there at the administration. I, I have friends that still work there and stuff. Like, I... I love Liberty University. I, I do not regret going there at all. My only regret is sometimes I wish I could have done a third year to get a minor. Um, that would have been cool. I wish I had gone to class more often. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. It was part of the growth. Great question. Ah, next one. This one came from Twitter. Twitter, you can go ahead and follow me at HeyRem. So this one came from Twitter. Why do you keep shilling for DC Comics over the obviously superior Marvel Comics? Okay, one, this is entirely my preference. I wish I was shilling for DC. I really do. I really wish because I love DC more. So Spider-Man got me into comics. Batman kept me in comics. And I think um, overall, I mean, the one thing to realize is that in terms of writers, I want to say that, um, you know, right now, I'm just talking right now because, I mean, everyone at Marvel, um, every Marvel showboater out there, and, you know, my argument is a majority of people who like Marvel, they've only seen the movies, they rarely, if ever, touched a comic book. But Marvel comic writers right now universally suck. Tanahasi Coates is a terrible writer. His Black Panther run sucked. His Captain America run sucked. The man who was a New York Times columnist, who all he does is talk about how, you know, America is an incredibly racist, evil country, capitalism is bad, has an army of flaming liberal white fans, and has made money through capitalism. And somehow he th- they, somebody thought he would be good to write comics, and I can tell you having bought his comics, which I regret, um, they suck. So there's one. Nick Spencer, a flaming progressive. Uh, I mean, he, he, he was in politics, worked for Democrats. He got into comics and he made Captain America a Nazi, wrote a terrible crossover event called Secret Empire, which is terrible, wrote a few other comic books. And now he's just, you know, urinating on Spider-Man every month. It's terrible. And, you know, for the record, here, here's here's something to understand. I don't care if a writer is progressive. I, I don't care about that. What I care about is the quality of the writers. Uh, Valiant Entertainment, people you know, online within the comic books, blogosphere and stuff, they know that Valiant is a probably the most left-wing publisher of comics out there, but I love Valiant Entertainment. Heather Antos is a flaming progressive, but you know what? I still read Bloodshot. I still read Exo Man of War. Doctor Tomorrow, I enjoy uh, Eternal Warrior. I'm not going to stop buying Valiant comics because I disagree with the politics of the writers. They are genuinely good comic book writers. Um, Dennis Hopeless Hallam. I mean, they're they're good writers. Uh, Matt Kent, that or kind, I can't pronounce his name. I mean, he he started off the Exo Man of War run, and he went over to Ninjak and Eternal Warrior and Unity. I mean, just great writers because they're good writers. And uh, a few years ago, I interviewed uh, Chuck Dixon. He's the creator of Bane. Uh, had a great run on The Punisher. Wrote GI Joe. I had him on the show and we talked about it. And Chuck Dixon, for for anyone that doesn't know, he's a conservative. He's a very, very big conservative, loves Trump. But, I mean, we were talking about, you know, the sway of politics in comics. And, you know, this is the guy who wrote Batman. He wrote the Nightfall event, which was the best Batman storyline ever, I think. Maybe second only to that of... um, you know, people people talk a lot about Batman Hush not being that great. I loved it. That was the first Batman collection I ever read. Then there's uh, Under the Red Hood, which I think is great. So, yeah, I'll say that Nightfall's third. Nightfall's third. But, uh, you know, he wrote that event. And, you know, Batman doesn't like guns. 
Now, Chuck Dixon owns guns, loves guns, is a member of the NRA, but he would write these impassioned speeches about why Batman will never use a gun. And it wasn't because he was secretly telling you, I, Chuck Dixon, hate guns. He was just trying to write a good Batman comic. And he knew that Batman as a character would never touch guns. So if you're a good writer, you're a good writer. If you're a good artist, you're a good artist. And for the record, you know, there's a reason why John Romita Jr., one of the best artists in the company in the business, went to DC. Ever since he left, Marvel, Marvel has sucked. Their art is just bad like go pick up a marvel comic right now it's bad it's bland it's poorly done half the times it looks incomplete it's it's bad the writing is bad and the art is bad and there's not a single marvel title right now being published that i would recommend to anyone i like the movies but i mean you know i'm the movies and the comics are different, and I'm only talking about this. Remember, Stan Lee has not written a comic for Marvel in decades. He hasn't. Jack Kirby left Marvel because Marvel was screwing him and did some phenomenal stuff over at DC. Notice how all the greats go to DC. Brian Michael Bendez was being worked to death at Marvel. Now he's at DC. So, you know, there, there's my argument. DC right now doing great. Marvel has been doing poorly for years. Uh, okay, next question. I, I love these. And remember, anywhere, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, hey, Remso. I'm on Parlor at the Parlor app at just Remso, R-E-M-S-O. Send your questions. Love these. I think, yeah, we'll go along for an episode. Why not? Where are you from? Unlike the introduction, I am not from Mexico. But according to Mexico, I'm apparently from Mexico. I'm originally from a small town called Sierra Vista, Arizona. My dad is from uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, was raised in uh, Florida, uh, ran around with the Army for a little bit, met my mom. My mom was from Seoul, Korea. My mom, whose father was an American soldier, American officer, moved and retired in Sierra Vista. She worked at the credit union. Mom met dad. Then came me. And then I've moved around since. I, it, it really sucks. Uh, I, I moved around a lot as a military kid. I lived in Australia. I lived in Kansas. I lived in Texas. I lived in Colorado. Actually, we moved between Colorado and Arizona twice from uh, Fort Carson, where my brother was born, to Sierra Vista. And then we've been in Virginia ever since. And I love Virginia. I consider myself a Virginian, first and foremost. Love the history. Love the land. Love the people. Love the culture. Love Virginia. But yes, I am... I am an American citizen, born and raised, and uh, yeah, originally from Arizona, the Goldwater State, and now I'm here in Virginia. I work in D.C. Uh, Next question. What is it like being a libertarian inside of the media? Um, Lonely. (laughs) <laughs> lonely i mean uh you know the media is predominantly left wing i write at a uh newspaper that's kind of rare because we have a, a, a very obvious conservative editorial section in the commentary section and then we have a news team that has people who are conservative liberal nonpartisan, don't care they're just great reporters we keep the reporters separated from the columnists and we have a good mix but you know i'm the only social media coordinator out there that is a libertarian and um you know i got to know that pretty quick because everyone told me you're the only one so while it's lonely it's given me an opportunity to really bring a lot of great people in for uh you know provide them a platform you know if i can kick the door open and get some great people in opportunity to spread the message of freedom i'm gonna do it i love it wouldn't trade it for anything in the world um next question as a social media coordinator would you classify facebook as a platform or a publisher okay this is my stance on it And I'm not going to say more about it because it can go on forever. My thing is this. If you're a platform, people should have unmitigated abilities to say what they want, post what they want, do what they want. As long as it is within the boundaries of the law, you're not threatening people. You're not blackmailing people. You're not posting you know, stuff, you know, child pornography on there. You're not posting snuff films on there. I mean, I believe that. Everyone from Sean King to Alex Jones and everyone in between from 
Brian Seltzer at CNN to Sean Hannity, we should all have an even playing field online. When you start explicitly taking stances on things, when you start silencing people, when you start deplatforming people, you have crossed the line over into being a publisher and you void all of that. And with Facebook, I will say, you know, one reason I don't do a lot on Facebook is because I'm afraid of Facebook. I've been hit by Facebook for a lot of things. And, um, you know, Facebook is definitely a. I mean, Facebook is totally a publisher. Twitter, I, I give more leniency at Twitter, unlike most people. I think that Twitter has predominantly kept their promise, even though they've done some shifty things. But I love Parler, for example. You could download the Parler app at the App Store or Google Play. I love it because there are no algorithms. Say what you want, stay within the law. Everyone can get a verified badge. I think verification is key because I think you have the right to protect your identity and, you know, verification, the little blue check mark at some places. I think that should only be used for people to prove they are who they are. And it shouldn't just be given out as like, you know, an indication that your voice matters and other people's don't. I think everyone should have a blue check mark if they want one. But uh, yeah, I mean, Facebook is definitely a publisher. Next question. Who is your favorite journalist? Um, a lot of people, they kind of, I, I want to get our terms straight. Journalist can mean multiple things. It can mean a commentator, a commentary journalist, or a reporter. Uh, I think one of my favorite reporters is actually at the Washington Times, um, Alex Swoyer. She's our legal analyst and reporter. She covers the Supreme Court and other stuff. She does a fantastic job. Uh, my favorite probably is um, my favorite probably other than her is uh, Brett Baer. I think Brett Baer at Fox is probably the most you know middle of the road objective person in the business. I know liberals that love him. I know conservatives that love him. Independents. I think Brett Baer and I know people that have worked for him. I, I met him a few times when we worked in the same building, uh, Hall, of, Hall of the States in D.C. Freedom Works is a few floors above. Um, uh, Fox, but I mean, Brett Baer is probably my favorite reporter. My favorite columnist, oh man, it's, I gotta say, Charlie LaDuff, uh, former New York Times, former Fox News show host. He hosts a show called The Americans. He now writes a weekly column for Deadline Detroit. If you do not know Charlie LaDuff, you gotta read his stuff. And he has two great books out there. One is Detroit, um, a memoir. It talks about him and his family in Detroit. When he came back after uh, being gone for like a decade, I think Detroit's a great book. And uh, my favorite piece of literary journalism that I think anyone has written in the past three decades is um, Shit Show. It's a great freaking book about the lead up to the 2016 election. It is great journalism. The audio book, he does the narration for Shit Show, it is phenomenal. If you want a free audio book, I would recommend that. If you message me and you don't have Audible, I will send you the book for free on Audible. You just set up an account and you get the book for free. I get nothing out of it. I just love that book. Uh, would definitely recommend that. So, yeah, for commentary journalism, even though he still calls himself a reporter, though, he's he's a commentary. He has a show called the No, no Bullshit News, No BS News, available wherever podcasts are. He does great. Yeah. I mean, Charlie LaDuff. Bar none, one of the people that got me back into journalism. And then James O'Keefe, the king, the king, the king, James O'Keefe from Project Veritas. His book, American Pravda, is what got me back in the game of media. Love it. Got to meet him a few months ago. I mean, James O'Keefe, yeah, so him. So, yeah, uh, reporters, Brett Baer, Alex Swoyer, commentary journalist, uh, Charlie LaDuff, and then, you know, investigative reporter, journalist, uh, guerrilla journalist, whatever term you want to apply, James O'Keefe. I mean, they, they all do great in their field. So um, what books do you think beginner libertarians should read? Um, obviously, my book, Stay Away from Libertarians. No, I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, I think you should buy that. But um, the book that really, really got me was Don't Hurt People and Don't Hurt Their Stuff, A Libertarian Manifesto by my old boss, Matt Kibbe. Love it. It's short, sweet, to the point. If you don't agree with it, you're a commie. Enough said. Uh, <laughs> do you really hunt ghosts or is that a stunt? I do. For those of you that have uh, been around the beat with me, you remember my old docu-series Haunted Republic where I used to lock myself in supposedly haunted places and film what happened. I am part of a paranormal investigation group called Argos Paranormal with my brother Ryan. Um, 
you know, we have some honorary members, Russ Bailey, Carl, Jason, and then uh, our other founding member, um, Brian Sujanin. We've also got um, uh, my good friend, my army buddy, Mike Amaral, but then he got a girlfriend and he left us. So he traded Ghost for a girlfriend and we haven't seen him since. I still love you, Mike. Come back. But yeah, um, season one of The Witching Hour, which is our new show where we actually do like longer, in depth, crazy investigations of new tools, new special guests, psychics, witches, every crazy thing in between. You can catch season one on uh, YouTube. We are across like 17 different public access stations for season two. So once a show comes out on one of our networks, a week later we put it on YouTube. Uh, season two will be coming out soon. Follow us on uh, Facebook at Argos Parent normal for all show updates i post on my social media as well but uh yeah i mean it's a great opportunity to really stretch your stretch the limits of your understanding of the world to see whether or not there are strange things out there i i think you should check it out you'll have fun whether you're into that stuff or not you get to see me scream and freak out in dark and scary places so yeah argos paranormal on facebook and twitter the witching hour season two coming soon um, what is your current stance on universal basic income? <laughs> the One of the coolest things I got to do in 2019 was I did a lot of debates. I wrote a bunch of stuff to a bunch of podcasts about UBI because I think I was one of the very few public libertarians out there that actually said I would rather have a universal basic income versus the current welfare state. No, am I saying we need universal basic income on top of the welfare state? No, but I said eliminate all of that and just give people money. We already have a Fed. We have a fiat system. The gold standard is gone. Might as well work with the best of the worst options and you could do that um you know i think you know people are gonna look at the whole covid pandemic here's the difference between ubi and that one ubi is you know that's it uh with this system with the with the covid crisis with the stimulus relief bill i mean that was really nobody's fault the way i saw it the government forced people not to work so the last thing that i think they should not do is not bear any responsibility for people losing out on money, losing the, losing an income. I got a pay cut. I mean, it, it sucked for everybody. Um, the way I see it, yeah, if anyone's going to get a bailout, bail out the American people before you bail out a bank or bail out Boeing. Um, has my stance on UBI changed? You won't see me out there charging for it. I mean, I did a few debates on the pro UBI side, but um, you know, I think it's the best of worst options. I think anything that takes from people and gives to other people is a terrible option. Uh, here and there, ipso facto. I think it depends on the circumstance. So yeah, there's that. Favorite drink? Uh, I'm a classic Coke guy. I'm soda soda fiend so yeah there's that but my favorite cocktail um i think that's what they meant it's so vague they favorite drink it's like ah what's your favorite animal i have cats and dogs i mean i can't pick uh yeah my my go-to drink is usually coke um love cherry coke cherry coke is it but my favorite cocktail i love a, a good whiskey sour without the garnish yeah i'm not a big coffee drinker i'm not a big beer drinker i like yingling i like stella but, uh, yeah, if I had to ask for a drink right now, I'd ask for a Coke. In fact, actually, I've got a Coke right next to me. I'm going to take a sip real fast. Ah, I wish I was a shill for Coke. I really do. Next question. Favorite and least favorite politicians? Least favorite politician is a bit more personal. It's uh, Jeff Helgeson, city councilman, lone Republican on the Lynchburg City Council. I ran a campaign against him. I still think he's a giant piece of shit. You could take that to the bank. Worst person I've ever ran a campaign against, and I've ran a campaign against a lot of people, some of which, ironically, I'm on better terms with than most people, even though we ran campaigns against each other. I'm on the friends list of a campaign manager who beat me in a race, and I like his photos, and I put LOL in the comments of memes he posts. We get along. But this Republican, a guy who I was, uh, people told me I should have liked, is the worst person ever, uh, refuses to get rid of power, does not help other people um, because he doesn't want to have other people outshine him. Uh, only thing he passed in years that actually he pushed for was a raise for the city council. Uh, worst politician I've ever encountered, Jeff Helgeson from Lynchburg. Favorite politician ever was my former boss, Tom Garrett, but he's not there anymore. I'd probably say Ted Cruz. I'm a good old-fashioned Ted Cruz guy. Uh, I think the beard is epic. 
You could see that he recently loaned his beard to Rand Paul, and that killed coronavirus in Rand Paul. So, yeah, least favorite, that dude from Virginia, who I'll never talk about again now because he's not worth it. And my favorite is Ted Cruz. Love him. Uh, Next one. (laughs) Favorite Democrat. The only Democrat I've ever gone out of my way to go for was Tulsi Gabbard. My girl Tulsi was not going to win the White House, but she won my heart and she won America's heart. Ah, oh, love Tulsi Gabbard, but she's leaving. I think after her, my favorite Democrat would be Kirsten Sinema, um, the Flaxen Fox from Arizona, my home state. She's done a great job. She's better than most Republicans on things. Probably one of the most libertarian senators in a. Uh, in, in the Senate. And I say that as some, as you know, not answering this question is just my favorite Democrat. I think now, since she'll be the only one in since Gabbard's leaving, uh, yeah, she'll probably be my favorite Democrat. She's also just one of my, I mean, she's like my top five at this point. She's, she's pretty cool. Uh, voted to impeach Trump. I was not happy about that, but whatever. Gotta keep the base happy. I get it. Game respects game. Gangster respects gangster. Next one. When were you a mall cop? Before or after you became a published author? <laughs> um, my first part-time job when I was tired of podcasting full-time because I was making no money was in January of 2018. I got a job for a security company as a mall cop in Reston, Virginia. And strangely, because I got that job, I was able to completely fund the self-publishing for my first book, Stay Away from Libertarians, and on the watch because I was the one of the only English-speaking employees that could both read and write in English. Uh, I was on the watch, so I was the guy dispatching people, looking at cameras during that time. I actually wrote the manuscript for Stay Away from Libertarians. So yeah, I was a mall cop before I became a published writer. But don't think being a writer made me rich because... Uh, about a year no by the end of the year i was um i was a cashier making less money than i was as a mall cop at gamestop but during that time i was also writing how to succeed in politics and other forms of devil worship and uh that came out in september of 2019 so yeah uh mall cop came before books but books certainly didn't make things better after a mall cop but uh yeah fun times i've got i've got mall cop stories on my first day some kids literally set a dumpster on fire that was fun that was a great literal description of my life at that time but it was fun all all things have to happen for a reason if i didn't have that job i wouldn't have the time or money to make my first book happen if that hadn't happened my second book wouldn't have happened i'm glad things happen Marcus Aurelius has a, has a quote in his book, Meditations. He says, uh, what is in the way is the way. And I think that's a beautiful way to describe it. All, all things happen for a reason. And how did you become a libertarian? Um, huh, I've, I've talked about this in the past, especially my first book, Stay Away from Libertarians. I became a libertarian because I was Mitt Romney's worst volunteer in high school. I found out the guy was basically a boring, white, slower Obama and then I heard about this dude, Gary Johnson, on the radio. Later learned about uh, Ron Paul, Justin Mosh, Thomas Massey, Rand and the like. Started reading about all these Austrian dudes, Frederick Hayek, Ludwig von Mises. And life got weird after that. So I became a libertarian by realizing the two parties are usually really just the same. And uh, that's about it. I, I had fun doing this. Let's do this again one day. Maybe not. Maybe not next episode. But let's do it again uh, in a few months or so. So yeah, for friends, old and new alike, thank you so much for hanging out with me. As you can tell from the questions, the show going forward is um, it's going to be different. It's going to be. Oh, do I have another question? Ooh, I've got a few questions left. Ah, ah. I have a few questions left. Ooh, I'm not going to end it now. I'm going to answer one more question. See, um, what's your favorite video game? Where do you get your news? What is, <laughs> what is your Boogaloo loadout? Your Boogaloo loadout. Um, Glock 19 AR-15. Okay, next question. Favorite video game? Uh, I'll, I'll just go through the rest really fast. Favorite video game? Uh, Red, Dead, Red Dead Redemption 2, but I also like the DLC that came for Far Cry 3. Blood Dragon played that game 20 million times every time I came home from uh, college for a break. Yeah, actually, I take it back. Far Cry 3, Blood Dragon. Where do you get your news? The Washington Times, duh. Uh, I'm a big fan of... Um, uh, 
the Detroit News on uh, Detroit. I like the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, yeah, I watch – I actually don't watch any cable networks. I, so I really just go to the, pub, the publishers because I look for news. I don't look for commentary. If I, know, if I go for commentary, I'll just read commentary elsewhere. But, uh, yeah, Wall Street Journal, Washington Times, duh, Detroit News. I think they do a pretty good job. Okay, uh, who are you voting for in 2020? Mm, maybe Trump. Maybe not. Leaning more towards Trump. Probably Trump, but I'm open. If Tulsi was in, I'd throw Tulsi a vote. Uh, don't know who the libertarians are. Maybe I'll go green. No, not 90, 90% possibility I'm going for Trump just because, oh, that'll be another episode. And uh, last question, what is going to make your new show different from the Rums of Republic and the Rums of Martinez experience? Ah, this is a great closer. Um, as you can see, done a lot, done a lot of crazy things. Some of you have been on this crazy ride with me for a while. Some of you are just getting on. What's going to be different is we're going to take the good from both of those, and we're going to go in a way that doesn't talk necessarily about politics. Um, there are the great people that do that. Go listen to the other phenomenal shows at the We Are Libertarians Network. But this show is going to really be taking those freedom ideas and applying it to your life. We're going to talk about Everything, philosophy, finance, boogaloo loadouts. I don't know. It's it's gonna get crazy, but it's less about the I you know the the schematic, so to speak, of liberty. The deep stuff that I've done for a while, the other people now are doing better, and we're gonna talk how to actually apply the principles of liberty in your life. Because if you're not living in the freedom fast lane, what are you doing, man? As always. Thank you. Looking forward to having you all join me on the next episode. Thank you to everyone at the We Are Libertarians Network. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Check out our other shows and more from the We Are Libertarians Network at wearelibertarians.com.